Good morning, everyone, um, and thanks for joining us today for the launch of the latest report by Perpetuity Research entitled Tackling Fraud in the Public Sector, a Local Government Perspective. This is based on original research commissioned by SIPFA to better understand how local authorities approach fraud in their organisations. To complement the research, SIPFA also published a short report highlighting what this independent research means for us and also identifying a number of key themes that they will be building on over the coming weeks and months. So just before we start this morning, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, please can I ask everyone who isn't talking to remain on mute. I've actually put you all attendees on mute just for now anyway. Um, there's a chat function at the bottom right of your screen. Um, if you've got any questions or comments as we go through, please can I ask you to put those in there. And then at the end of the session, we'll deal with the questions in a Q&A um, format. Um, if you've got any problems that you can't hear, please do write that in the chat as well so we know um, what's happening. Um, and finally, we're just going to be recording this session today, so it's available afterwards if you want to listen again or refer anybody else to this session. So now um, I'm going to pass you over to the capable hands of two of the authors of the report, Martin Gill and Janice Goldstraw-White, um, to tell you more about the research and the findings. So over to you, Martin. Thank you, Laura. And thank everyone joining us. Um, I've got Janice with me, Dr. Janice goldstraw Weiss, who was the lead researcher on the project. And after I've spoken, uh, Janice will be joining in the uh, questions and answers, uh, um, uh, not least because uh, she knows uh, a lot more about the detail than I do. Uh, um, so uh, looking forward to um, just uh, summarizing what were the key findings. Uh, the project actually came out of a SIPFA initiative. Um, um, the organization is keen to uh, be involved in thought leadership and to engage in original research. And uh, we were approached by uh, Liz Hickson, Matthew Hedford in particular, and uh, um, the research was led by, on the SIPFA side by Laura, who's our point of contact, and uh, throughout was extremely uh, engaged with us. Uh, um, so we've got, a, we've, we've got a, a, a good project that's been produced. We're very, very pleased with it. And uh, today I'm just gonna get through some of the headline issues. Uh, it will be available for the world to see. Uh, so there is a chance to uh, follow up uh, after this on uh, some of the key findings. So let's just uh, go a little bit about what we were trying to do. The focus was to better understand how local authorities tackle fraud. Uh, um, we did this through consultation with senior officers in local authorities. Uh, and we were interested in how local authorities balance reactive detective and investigative work with the more prevention activities. It's a state of the art, what's going on? And so this report is based on feedback from 303 survey responses, respondents from UK local authorities. And we also held uh, three round table discussions, uh, two in London, one in Chester. Um, Janice and I uh, um, attended these, uh, where we were able to tease out some of the issues and were involved in uh, uh, a discussion. Also in the survey, we had some sort of feedback where people could uh, um, uh, offer comments and thoughts on some of the questions. So that's what we did. Uh, um, and the first uh, reveal of the findings is today. Um, so generally, senior officers perceive fraud to be a problem, um, but they were generally positive about their own ability to tackle it, uh, yet recognized there was room for improvement in the approaches. Uh, um, the majority of responses felt that leadership teams, and I'm just going to read out some of the key things they said, sent out strong anti-fraud messages, have successfully created cultures where individuals uh, are aware of fraud risks, and staff know what to do should they come across suspected fraudulent activity. Now, the majority said this. And when you read the report, you will see that within there, there are some variations. Uh, some groups were more likely to than others, and uh, there were certainly some qualifications. And one of the things that does come through this uh, is that it's tempting to talk about local authorities as a single group, yet within that, as we're about to see, practices varied quite markedly, um, as did views and as did experiences. Um, uh, when considering the future, it was suggested that a shift towards more preventative rather than reactive methods 
uh, was favoured, and we'll add a little bit of detail about that in a minute. Uh, but there's some barriers out there, and there's some barriers that, if we're going to go forward constructively, need to be tackled. Uh, now, I'm going to put up some um, slides for you with lots of stats on them, uh, um, just because uh, um, I know that people like to look at these, not least when uh, we're doing it in this delivery format. Um, but uh, um, just to say, I'm not going to read out everything on each slide. I'm just going to talk to you about some of the key issues. Uh, um, we do get this point uh, that fraud is a problem and it's increasing. Uh, um, uh, but here's a really important finding. Generally, people said, although it's bad, not in my backyard. Um, this was less so in people's organisation, much less so in their departments. And we shouldn't be surprised at that, by the way, when surveys are done, a public view of crime, it's not unusual to get a similar finding. Yes, it's a problem, but not so much in my area. Um, um, uh, picked up by impressions uh, people have of how, it's, how, it, how they believe it is to be elsewhere. Uh, um, interestingly, though, we're getting on for a half or well over 40 percent at least felt that fraud levels were underreported in their organisations. Now, here's a finding. Overall, uh, the crime survey for England and Wales, which is generally seen as a better measurement of crime than uh, of police statistics, uh, about a third of it is fraud. About a third of crime in the United Kingdom is fraud. And yet here we have uh, well over four in 10 uh, of senior officers saying that it was underreported. So not only is it a major uh, uh, component of crime in the UK, it's also one of those that's most underreported. This is a major, major issue on the horizon, and one that the world is only just beginning to, to see the implications of and see uh, uh, um, approaches to tapping it. Um, one of the uh, areas we look at in more detail is uh, uh, both incident and causes. Uh, it's the second bullet point I want to come to um, mostly, though. Uh, um, three reasons why staff commit internal fraud. Poor internal controls, personal issues, and greed. And it's tempting to say, well, that first one, poor internal controls, is something that local authorities can do something about. Uh, uh, um, and greed is something that's out there that we're just going to have to react to. Uh, the middle one, personal issues, somewhat falls into both camps. Um, I remember a few years ago now uh, in research work that I conducted in prison with Forsters, and that's something I've done quite a lot of, and so has Janice, um, um, speaking to uh, some offenders who committed fraud in local authorities. And it's one of these I recall remember telling me that he'd gone along to the HR department to say that he had personal problems um, and was told by the HR department that um, there wasn't anything they could do to help him. Now, this is his side of the story, of course, when he's in prison. Um, but it does raise this point that the more that managers can be aware of staff and their personal issues, and the more help there can be within organisations to tackling those, the more that the opportunity is there uh, to counter that, certainly for internal fraudsters. The two major reasons for external fraud offered were, again, poor organisational controls, uh, and the lack of staff training to identify fraudulent activity. That one we're going to come back to, that one emerges in various guises. Um, uh, um, there was general, uh, many of the sample felt that uh, um, uh, local authorities were an easy target for fraudsters, um, uh, and uh, a little bit more of that will be revealed in a minute. Uh, um, certainly there was a general awareness of fraud risks, but the sense that austerity had increased the scale of the problem. Now, this is austerity, don't forget, in the context of Brexit. Austerity in the context of, uh, sorry, Brexit and uh, uh, the government's uh, approach over the last years. This is before the, the uh, COVID-19 and all that that implies. So I think we have every reason to be concerned that uh, um, uh, fraud will be one of those issues uh, uh, that is likely to be under the spotlight uh, as the current crisis unfolds. Um, uh, we asked about risk perception, and just to repeat, a lot more on this in the report, uh, uh, um, but it was about this reality that as the nature of organisational operations change, so does fraud risks. 
And of course, one thing that's been happening is that more has been going online. And uh, um, one of the things that uh, is very striking from speaking to forces in prison is to recognize that what is an opportunity for organizations is also an opportunity for fraudsters. Uh, uh, um, uh, the good thing is majority, but not all as you will see, felt that uh, their organization um, was uh, able to report for, there, there wasn't a reluctance to do so. That's important. Uh, um, clearly, the more the organizations know about the problem, the more potential there is to build up a picture of it, therefore, and allocate resources and develop policy accordingly. Um, we looked at counter fraud arrangements, uh, uh, um, and this slide, perhaps more than others, uh, shows just the variation in practice that exists around the country in terms of uh, approaches to tackling fraud. Uh, um, um, you can see that uh, uh, um, sometimes there was a dedicated fraud team. Uh, sometimes internal audit was the uh, uh, main body in charge. Uh, uh, sometimes through a shared service, it was outsourced, and even other arrangements and operations. Once again, we can talk in terms of local authorities' approach if we wish, in general terms, but it's important to recognize that practices and methodologies vary considerably. And this was certainly something that came out in our consultation sessions, the uh, uh, group discussions, the three group discussions we had where uh, those present were particularly keen to say, um, it's easy to talk us, about us all as if we're one, but there are vast variations in practice and whatever approach is taken needs to recognize that uh, um, approaches do vary markedly. 49% um, uh, believe that counter fraud and IT officers work well together to pursue fraud. And uh, um, we're approaching, well, well over six in 10 at least, stated that there's a strong relationship with external organizations. And uh, um, these findings are striking in their own right. Uh, um, the fact that less than half believe that there was a good working relationship internally, at least in uh, this specific context, and not everyone felt there was good outside uh, relationships is crucial. One of the things that's coming through the approaches to tackling fraud around the world is the need to engage meaningfully with others about uh, um, what the problem is and about how we can best respond. Uh, uh, and we'll come in a minute to some thoughts on uh, how we can take that uh, forward. Another key component of tackling fraud effectively, and this is seen as being at the forefront of best practice uh, uh, across countries, is the need to create internally an anti-fraud environment. Now, uh, um, six in 10 believe that they did have a committed leadership team uh, sending out a strong fraud message. Uh, yet, uh, um, as you can see, more than one in 10, or 10 thought, felt this to be untrue. There is though an important point between sending out a strong message and then delivering on it. And uh, um, one of the uh, crucial points about any strategy that uh, takes place for tackling any initiative, uh, not least fraud, is the need, need for leadership to be committed. Uh, um, and in part, this is about, of course, saying the right things, but it's also in part about backing it up. And uh, we'll be returning to this point in a minute, but uh, um, what is clear is that uh, um, uh, that that, that there was a disjuncture between those two things in some cases. Um, about half felt that there was an adequate control environment, uh, um, uh, but over a fifth felt this was inadequate. And many of you will have your own view on that, about those figures and whether they tell you that's a, a semi-positive or a semi-negative. It's, it's also, of course, both. Um, uh, um, but that those who are senior officers are uh, uh, not endorsing the approaches taken is one of the key components of the claim we and others will make about this. There is a need to think differently about how we respond to a problem that's not going to go away and is highly likely uh, uh, at least to um, uh, re-emerge in uh, different guises uh, um, through this current crisis. Um, very encouragingly, the majority over in 10 felt their colleagues 
would report a fraud against the organization if they identified one. Uh, um, and only a minority, a very few, said they would not. That's a really important part of an anti fraud environment, engaging staff and making sure that staff are uh, um, not just on message, but acting on message. Um, two thirds, nearly anyway, felt of Zoe employees would know what to do if they discovered a suspected fraud. And yet again, over in one in 10 thought that they wouldn't. Um, um, it's encouraging that uh, um, two thirds felt that staff would know what to do. But of course, this is important. This is the difference between knowledge and action. It is one thing to say our staff would know what to do, but that's a precondition for taking action. Uh, um, and so we need to make sure this anti-fraud culture is clear in its definition, what that means, what it means for people at the sharp end, what it means for senior managers. That's a key ingredient of making sure that what follows is real in its consequences. Uh, um, uh, and here we go again, that um, with regards to current practices, there were those who felt that uh, um, there was a good deterrent and there was plenty of thought in some cases that uh, um, more could be done. That's the overall approach. Uh, um, we asked about fighting fraud in the future and um, there were two priorities I, that, that, that we asked about currently. Uh, uh, and they chose a list of options, preventing fraud from happening in the first place, and second, raising fraud awareness. Now, preventing fraud from happening in the first place is of course a given, uh, uh, and behind that disguise is a whole range of thoughts about how that should be done. But what it does show is the emphasis on prevention is really important. Indeed, this was emphasized uh, as we asked people about uh, their chosen future priorities. Uh, um, where the same were mentioned, but the uh, level of support increased even more. That if we're going to think constructively about fraud, we need to highlight fraud prevention. And the trouble with this is that often it's seen as less attractive. Uh, sometimes some people have seen this in other contexts as a, a bit of a cop out. Well, you would say you're preventing it. We want to see results. And it's a lot less tangible sometimes to show that uh, um, fraud prevention is uh, uh, producing results, especially given that we don't, uh, so much of it is unknown. But re in reality, uh, um, uh, if we can prevent fraud taking place in the first place, that's contribution and one that's highly favored, uh, not least by uh, um, our sample. Uh, when we asked about what was the most important uh, issues, and again, uh, these were options. Um, the use of technology uh, came top of the list. Uh, once again, here's a biggie. Um, we've separately, uh, purposely researched, done a report uh, only out uh, um, uh, late last year, where we interviewed some offenders, uh, not just fraud offenders, but more broadly about technology. And there's no doubt at all that they see that as an opportunity too. Uh, um, and uh, the second point here, staff being trained in fraud awareness, perhaps uh, leads uh, 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 credence to this point about technology. Yes, it offers enormous opportunities for preventing fraud. But according to those on the criminal side, it also offers enormous opportunities to them too. In other words, it's a, making, a, a matter of making sure the technologies are fit for purpose, that they're integrated and that they work. Uh, um, also worth pointing out there the importance of good fraud leadership and therein lies an opportunity for fraud professionals uh, um, to show, to take a lead here. Uh, um, it is worth uh, uh, remembering that good fraud prevention is about a culture across the organization. Um, it is about leadership. Uh, um, um, from within local authorities. But it's also about expertise within fraud team. But here's a chance for fraud professionals to lead the way on engaging uh, the right elements. Uh, uh, and partnership working there is, is, a, is a massive one. Sometimes we can treat the prevention of crime generally as simplistic. Uh, um, when you look around the world, at the, and I'm just speaking as an academic here, always changing, always dangerous, but just for a second. And you look at the reason why initiatives fail in crime prevention, in fraud prevention. There are perhaps two main ones. 
uh, uh, one of these is the uh, uh, the issue of um, you, we had the wrong approach in the first place. And the second one is we just didn't do it very well. I'm just talking simplistically for a minute. Uh, um, and this comes down to having the right approach uh, um, uh, executed well. It remains the holy grail. And uh, uh, when you speak to fraudsters in prison, it's when one of those two fails that they get their opportunity. Uh, and we mustn't forget the importance here of the fraud professional. And again, we'll come to, back to that in a minute. And we asked about um, future risks in the context of fraud, uh, fraud areas. Worth, worth mentioning that uh, um, there were two big issues that cropped up here. One was tackling the issue of cybercrime and organised crime, not because the latter in particular is particularly new, uh, and cybercrime has been around for a while now, but because they were beginning to emerge in a much bigger context in local authorities, and many felt they were areas where local authorities hadn't yet got the best grasp. Uh, and back to this point about service delivery, uh, um, the outsourcing of more functions was put on as a point, uh, um, and putting more service online, which I've already uh, mentioned. And these were, would, were, was, were, were believed to have increased the exposure to fraudulent attacks. Uh, um, uh, and the point being is not that putting services online or not that outsourcing services in themselves were, were bad, of course not. It was more that they create new risks and in creating new risks, there needs to be a new, a, a new approach, a new thinking about how these are managed. And it's been bringing on board different groups, uh, perhaps in different ways. Procurement might be in one uh, uh, example. Those in frontline delivery on um, uh, online services might be another. And engaging those and making fraud prevention messages meaningful for those groups uh, uh, is fundamental. Uh, um, uh, we've also looked at uh, uh, the issue of stretch resources. Uh, um, it would be surprising to me, actually, if this hadn't cropped up. Uh, there was a concern, and perhaps this is going to be heightened as things progress over the next few months, given the current crisis that uh, the general all-round uh, uh, lack of funding will find its way into uh, less investment in counter-fraud initiatives. Uh, um, and it was also in a different way a concern about how respondents felt that systems might not be regularly maintained and updated to keep pace. In other words, there are these new systems, there are these new approaches, there is this new thinking, there are these new threats. How do we keep on, on top of all these? How do we make sure have the right approaches that we maintain them, that we maintain, uh, uh, that we're upbeat and uh, we engage continually. So let's move on then to uh, uh, barriers to progress and some of the recommendations that uh, uh, we're putting forward. Uh, um, so uh, um, Janice and I, Janice in particular, have, have led on this. We've got two other colleagues, uh, Charlotte Howe and Katie McGeer, who've also been crucial here in helping us think through these barriers and these responses. Uh, um, so one of the barriers is the disjointed working arrangement within authorities, between separate local authorities and across the public sector. Uh, and again, it's one of these issues, isn't it? It's tempting to think about uh, um, local authorities as one thing, uh, but within that there are a whole range of uh, um, pockets of activity. Uh, and sometimes these pockets are joined up rather well. And it's easy to point to those examples. But what we've also got to focus on is the pockets of activities where they're operating in quite separate environments. And uh, where that is happening, and that appears to be very common, not least uh, this came through in our, uh, our group discussions, in those three group discussions I told you about. People pointed out that, yes, we can point to good examples, uh, um, but there are a lot that are suboptimal and uh, um, we're not milking the opportunity either within local authorities or within the public sector to um, uh, uh, get the best response to uh, uh, tackling fraud. Uh, people pointed to fraud hubs uh, um, and uh, how these have aided joint working relationships. Uh, um, they were generally uh, positively received at least in the uh, uh, focus group discussions we did but as it was made clear these are not UK-wide and they're not compulsory. And uh, certainly those in areas where they weren't them pointed out they uh, um, 
they felt they'd missed out accordingly. So yes, we can highlight good practice here, but we need to recognize the barriers that also exist within them. Um, the third point, the third barrier, and a fundamental one again, it was always, not always seen as a priority by senior officers. Uh, this is not to say that people were not always saying the right things. This is talking about the difference between the theory and the action, between the saying the right thing and doing the right thing. Uh, um, uh, we need to encourage local authorities to uh, um, direct resources to tackling fraud. Now, the resource issue is not going away. And I think one of the real problems that we have, of course, is that the fraud message is just one of those calling on demand for resources. Uh, um, but certainly, and that's why we've mentioned it here, there was a seemed to be a major barrier in that uh, uh, resources were not being marshaled effectively uh, towards tackling fraud. Uh, and we'll come back to this in a minute in uh, uh, some of the recommendations that we've made. There was a motivation to protect a local authority's reputation, that's the statement of the obvious, but sometimes the protection of the local authority's reputation got in the way of publicizing counter fraud work externally. And certainly in the focus group discussions, we heard about uh, uh, some of the tensions that can crop up when there was a value perhaps in highlighting a certain type of fraud. And then representatives of groups who uh, um, uh, of the of the groups who were offenders here didn't were, were sensitive to say, well, be careful you don't pick on them here. Uh, uh, so there is this issue that uh, uh, there needs to be a, a thought given to communication in the best possible way the types of approaches that are going to raise awareness, mindful of the fact that at the same time. Uh, 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 there can be a damage to reputation in not doing it well. Um, uh, uh, and this point that resources are constrained and ne therefore never has there been a more important occasion to put forward a successful business case. Uh, um, and people pointed out there were difficulties in quantifying the costs and benefits. And there in particular, preventative activity was pointed out as being problematic. Yes, this is going to be a bigger part of what we need to be doing going forward, but we need to recognize that it's tricky, it's difficult to quantify, and difficult, therefore, to show that it has value. Um, uh, moreover, uh, what constitute prevention itself needs to be thought about a lot more. If it's the Holy Grail, and uh, uh, we think it's a, a, a very big deal, and so did our sample, then we need to be clear about what is it? What, when we talk about rental, what do we mean? Uh, that's going to be a crucial ingredient of selling it effectively. There was also an issue about sharing data. Uh, uh, um, uh, many felt this was difficult and um, sometimes restricted by the quality of the data itself. Now, I would have been surprised if this hadn't been here uh, because in our life as researchers, uh, working in crime prevention and fraud prevention across different dimensions, the sharing of data crops up time and time and time again. There's something of an irony here in that we're moving into a world in which there is more and more data and uh, people are asking for more, report more crime, for example, so we knew more about it. Share resources from different groups because uh, that way we'll build up a picture, bigger picture. And yet there are the, the constraints on sharing data are enormous, uh, all sorts. There are legal issues, there are privacy issues, there are um, manageability issues, there are systems issues, there are data compatibility issues, uh, um, and the quality of data itself uh, um, uh, was also pointed out to be something that uh, uh, got in the way. So, uh, um, perhaps what I'd like to do now, if I might, is just uh, um, in the last 10 minutes or so, just uh, um, point out some of the recommendations uh, that we've been making on the back of the work that we've been done. So we're independent researchers. Uh, um, we had a great remit from SIPFA, which was to say, go away, research this, think about it, and come back with your thoughts. Um, uh, um, uh, and these are uh, uh, some of the areas that uh, we think that uh, 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 merit a focus based on what the researchers said. I'm very encouraged, actually, that um, 
there's been a local authority strategy published recently and uh, that seems to back up uh, uh, many of the findings that uh, we're putting, uh, putting forward and we hadn't seen that by the way completely independent research uh, done before that was published but I think what we're able to do is add a lot more depth and maybe come up with some uh, slightly different thoughts and uh, um, uh, that can enhance our thinking going forward. So we need to make counter fraud a higher profile activity within local authorities. Uh, um, um, behind each of these is a whole lot more thinking and uh, 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 examination that needs to go on. So obviously I've only got a few minutes here so I'm just going to whiz through these so you get an insight into the range of thoughts that are going on. We need to reduce the apparent impediments caused by ineffective national Martin, we've lost the sound there slightly, unfortunately. Maybe you could... Are you back? Oh yes, you're back now. Yes, yeah, we just lost a bit of what you were saying there. I'll, I'll go back to I'll go back to star recommendations. Just mention the first one very briefly. So it was about the need to make counter fraud a higher profile activity within the I've just moved on to impediments and talking about um, ineffective national and local data. This cropped up time and time again uh, as an issue. Um, here's a point. Counter fraud as a profession should be promoted across local government. And here's a, a, an issue that we would like to put forward. Tackling fraud is skilled. Uh, marshalling the right resources together is a skilled task. We should not assume that it is easy, that people find it easy, and that keeping on top of it is easy. And so putting forward the counter fraud issue as a profession and all the issues that cropped up as being a part of that uh, um, really need to be uh, uh, highlighted. Uh, um, we need to promote and support shared delivery models and this is about recognising that uh, there are lots of different types of doing, uh, uh, ways of doing this. Uh, there are lots of skills out there. Uh, there are particularly specialist skills about, uh, um, both across lo local authorities um, and across the public sector. And we need to harness these to good advantage. Uh, the fact that uh, they do exist is not the same as saying they're used to best effect and there needs to be a think about how they can be uh, uh, marshalled effectively. Um, we would argue, of course, and it's easy for us to say that, the public sector should work closely together. It's striking in a way that, uh, um, that there isn't more uh, 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 joined up thinking there or more joined up action. It's not to say there isn't. Uh, it's not to say there aren't pockets of good activity. There are. And some excellent examples but there's plenty of opportunity to do more. Uh, criminals rely on it not being joined up, it's a key component of how they're able to exploit their, their work. Um, we need to put forward the case for the cost benefits of fraud work to promote the business case for investment. It's no good shouting in the abstract we want more money without being able to show and illustrate through tangible means that it's a, a, a worthwhile investment. Uh, uh, um, don't forget, uh, um, fraud prevention saves money, it's an investment and it needs to be seen as that and thought of that and there's work to be done in putting that message across. No wonder then I would argue that fraud prevention is a skilled activity and we need skillful counter fraud professionals to take forward the uh, uh, argument. There are legislative barriers hampering counter fraud activities. Uh, um, uh, uh, it seems crazy, but it's not surprising, it's spoken about. But let's highlight these and let's put in place action plans to uh, counter them. And the government should consider a structured duty for public agencies to share data to counter fraud. Uh, um, the sharing of data is fundamental. Start, uh, um, a lot's been said about this. Once we've got the data shared though, it's a completely different skill set to make the most of it, to harness it so that we can begin to think about how we use it to best advantage. Um, uh, uh, we've got a few recommendations here about the role of different officers, uh, um, but really senior leaders and those in specialist positions uh, need to be aware of the important role they play in highlighting good practice and most of all setting an agenda for what is acceptable and what is not. Uh, um, uh, 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 so the whole business about setting the priority, getting people engaged, uh, raising fraud awareness, data share sharing, engaging meaningfully externally, 
these are very big dynamic issues. It takes leaders to be committed to them. It takes fraud professionals to make sure they happen. It takes everyone uh, to make it work. Uh, uh, and therein lies uh, uh, some of the key issues uh, which I've tried to highlight in, in a rush through. I wonder whether if I could just make one other point though. One of the things that's been crystal clear to Janice or I as we've been doing this work is that there is an enormous amount of very, very skilled activity going out, out there in local authorities, very. And too often, um, people in fraud prevention act under the radar. Indeed, if I stand back, and if I might be so bold, is that my criticism of, of you as a collective group of fraud professionals is that all too often, you don't say how good you are. There is an enormous amount of good work going on. And so what we would like you to do is to consider putting forward those who are really good for the Tackling Economic Crime Awards. These are all the leading fraud association, including SIPFA, who nominate a judge, lots of different categories. The entry is open this summer. Uh, it's about more than just putting forward good people. It's about the sector of fraud prevention saying, look, we are doing some good work and it matters that we're good. Um, if people out there in fraud prevention don't do their job properly, the consequences, as we've heard about, can be serious. Uh, um, you can download the report here. Uh, um, do please uh, uh, take, a, take a look. Uh, do spread the word. There's going to be a lot of um, um, work going out, um, as from midday today, by the way, as from midday, don't go there now, uh, um, so that you can see uh, um, uh, um, what we said in full. Uh, and we're going to be working with SIPFA on another study. We're talking about it already. Uh, um, rather impressively, SIPFA are committed to uh, thought leadership, are committed to continuing with uh, um, developing new insights and new thinking. Um, and if I might, I'd just like to end with one story. And it's a story that um, when I was last in prison, uh, um, about 18 months ago now, I was uh, um, um, interviewing Forsters. And it's a message from a prison cell to people out there doing fraud prevention, uh, which really highlights what's so important about the research and the findings and the recommendations. Uh, um, I, was, I was interviewing Forsters, and as I was about to be escorted off the wing, a uh, prisoner came up to me and said to me, uh, Martin, I'm a prisoner and I'm, I'm in for fraud. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a story. Uh, um, but before I tell you the story, would you agree to tell fraud professionals about the story? So um, with qualifications, I said I would, and this was his story. He said, believe it or not, when I was on the outside, I was in charge of trying to get my organization to take fraud prevention seriously. And unfortunately, I couldn't. Uh, um, within my organization, the hierarchy weren't interested. The uh, um, other people in the organization would not share information about fraud prevention. Uh, um, um, when, we, when we did spot an issue, we couldn't get action against it. There was a great reluctance to report it to the police. And even when we did report it to the police, I couldn't get the police interested. And I said, well, I've, I've heard stories like that, so I'm not wholly surprised. Oh, Martin, he said, that's not my point. This is not the message I want you to pass to the four professionals. This is the message I want you to pass to, pass to four professionals. He said, then I came to prison. And in prison, everyone's sharing information. We're sharing information about who the easy targets are, what are the best ways of committing offences? How we got caught and how to avoid it next time? He says, don't you think it's the wrong way around? That's the message I want you to communicate. So from a prison cell to you to say, the reason why we need to think differently about fraud prevention is the consequences of not doing so are so great. And while in any one report, there's no magic cure, there's no magic set of answers, what we do have here is an opportunity to think differently based on findings from those who are most responsible for leading the charge against tackling fraud in local authorities and recognition that while there are pockets of great activity, while there are examples of good practice, what we must more fundamentally learn from these findings is that there's a great opportunity to do better. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I've told to to finish at 11.40, so I've been a, a, good, a, good, a good chat. I'm now going to um, uh, um, ask uh, uh, Janice to join me in uh, answering any questions. Uh, um, Laura, I think you want to come back in first? 
Yes, thanks, Martin. I think that was a fantastic presentation. I'm really interested to hear your take on the research and you really brought it to life there for all of us, I think. I had a lot of enthusiasm on the chat as well for people saying, please, can we have a copy of those brilliant slides? Really enjoyed listening. So so that's fantastic. Um, thank you very much. And I, I like the point you made at the end about information sharing. Certainly my own perspective is that we need to do a lot more to share information with one another. So that's fantastic. Um, Right, so let's just get Janice in as well. Janice, um, you're online too now to answer any questions we've got. Um, and so I'm just going to read out the questions that have come through and then hand over to you, Martin and Janice to answer them. So I hope that's okay. So the, the first one actually leads on pretty well from your comments about criminals. Um, Karen has asked, what sort of crimes were committed by the people you spoke to in prison? Can you give us a bit more detail on those? Yes, so just to be clear, well, Janice and I have both done studies separately. This was not part of this research. I was just uh, um, trying to, I mean, between us, I think we've covered a whole variety of different offences. Uh, and by the way, when you uh, go to the website to download this report, you will see other reports that we've done, and you're welcome to download those free of charge as well on interviews we've done with offenders in prison. So those who've committed internal uh, uh, fraud offences, external fraud offences, including those who work in the public sector, including along the way those who work in local authorities. Uh, and what runs through those findings, I think, is this uh, alarming uh, issue that, uh, put simply, fraudsters rely on you not being good in order to be successful. Uh, um, and the better that fraud prevention is, the greater the, the, the risk of them getting caught and therefore deciding to commit the offences in the first place. And it's why, actually, to be honest, I've been a great advocate and are really keen to push forward the case that fraud prevention isn't easy. Uh, um, and we need to make sure that uh, uh, people are aware of how skilled this is uh, and take our lead from those around the country who are doing really, really a, leading a, a great charge, in some cases, outstanding performance. Janice, do you want to ask me just make a brief comment about some of the work you've done in prison? Hello, Janice. Hello. Hello. Janice, over to you. Yes, OK. Um, one of the comments I'd like to make with people I interviewed within organisations was um, a lot of the time, a lot of these people had been there a long time and they knew the weaknesses in the systems, but they were never exploited. So I think an important thing is to actually always remember uh, what is the tipping points for individual people? And I think Martin mentioned this earlier about sort of knowing your staff and there is that midway where you can do something between sort of personal reasons and internal controls where you need to support your staff uh, and to keep an eye on them and see if anything's sort of irregular, why, why they, they would then exploit controls at that particular time that they knew were, were weak for a long time. Great. Thank you both uh, very much. Um, so another question we've got here is from Jenny. Um, did the research find any changes in views on data sharing with the introduction of the GDPR? I think we had a number of comments on this uh, within the roundtable discussions. I think what we put in the report is in some ways it complicated what was already a complex area. Um, so in theory, the, the GDPR should have made things easier for people to to share. In reality, in some instances, it hasn't. People are a bit nervous about sharing data, they're confused, and um, some are hiding behind this as a reason not to share it. And I think um, this is something that the, perhaps the government need to have a look at to just clarify what the rules and regulations are on this, because people are uncertain. Thank you very much. That's that's really helpful. Um, so a question here from Ian then. Um, were you made aware of the government counter fraud profession, which is aiming to promote counter fraud as a profession and provide training and skills? Oh, yes. Uh, um, this uh, uh, I'll let Janice go into more detail, but uh, absolutely. And uh, um, uh, uh, an interesting initiative. Uh, one with a lot of potential, and I think Janice, uh, this was a particular conversation at one of our or one of our discussions. Yes, 
certainly at one of our tables, one of the representatives from a local authority was uh, already trialling this in their organisation. So obviously, yes, we're, we're aware of it. Um, the only comments we, we got otherwise from that was um, people wanted to ensure that local authorities were well represented in this. Uh, obviously, it's a, a central government initiative originally, so they wanted to see obviously changes to actually see how um, local government fitted into that and really how it would actually affect, you know, tackling um, counter fraud locally. And was there a general positive feeling about the profession? Is that what you would take away there? I think there was a general positive feeling about getting um, counter fraud more professionalised, yes. Yeah, I think the thing is, this is something that uh, um, is emerging as an issue. And uh, um, there's no doubt at all, in my mind, that uh, um, out there in local authorities are some extremely conscientious, determined, able uh, people who uh, I often feel undersupported. And uh, um, the opportunity to be part of a peer group uh, that promotes the interest of full, pro full profession as an area of specialist expertise and helps to frame the ways in which it develops as a profession, but also the ways in which it engages meaningfully with others and with opportunities and with new ideas is uh, uh, one um, that is to be welcomed. So, uh, um, so far so good, although of course it's uh, still just beginning to happen. And somebody has asked for more specifics um, on the service areas in local councils which were more fraud prone. Did you get any sense of that during the work that you've done, uh, Janice and Martin? Yeah, Janice, you might want to just speak to that. We, there were some areas we've highlighted in the report, actually, haven't we? Yes, there's some, some areas we highlight in the report, and that basically mirrored what you'd put in your CFAX. Um, report as well. If I had to pick one particular area that people seem to be very concerned about, it seemed to be social services. Uh, and that came up time and time again during our um, roundtable discussions. And I think this was mainly because they felt a little bit out of control with it, that, that, that people weren't being reassessed and that people so reassessed for care, yes. And yeah. Therefore, people were, were continuing claim things that, that they possibly were no longer entitled to. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, in discussion and examples, there were uh, uh, lots of these. I mean, we didn't, it would be the wrong sort of report to try and measure the scale of incidents of uh, 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 crime. It would need a different approach. Yes, absolutely. This was very much focused on perceptions and understandings, wasn't it? So, not the detail of cases as such um so another question oh sorry go on in the report you'll see a few areas where people did mention them and we, we we've highlighted these uh but that context needs to be uh, recognized mm -hmm. and i suppose another contextual question that's just come through but do you feel that you've seen any difference between fraud at a national level and a local level um from the research that you've done uh, well, our sample did, of course. Uh, um, our sample felt that uh, um, it was more serious nationally and locally. And the more local you get, the more uh, likely people were to say that it wasn't as bad. Nothing surprising there. That's exactly what you would expect to find. So, in that context, the answer is yes. Uh, um, not an especially surprising one. Wouldn't it be amazing if people felt that crime in their department or in their organisation was uh, higher than it was? Uh, uh, was particularly high. I mean, you'd think, goodness me, uh, they ought to be conscientious. So it wasn't a particularly surprising finding. Janice, is there anything you'd like to add there? Um, no, I think it was as we sort of expected, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a follow-up question then from Diane about offenders. Um, what was the single most effective thing that would prevent a fraudster from reoffending that anyone told you in those discussions? Uh, well, 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 we'll each do one here. So, so um, here's my point. Here's my more general point about offenders uh, generally. And I just want to tell a very quick story, actually. So uh, you can think, Janice, while I just tell this quick story, another quick story for me, about my time interviewing offenders in prison. But I remember this uh, a great conversation I had one day when um, 
I was interviewing actually an armed robber, but it could have been any offender. And the question I asked him was, uh, on the day you committed your robbery, what did you think the chances were of getting caught? Were they very high, were they medium, or were they low? And um, um, when I'm giving this talk publicly, I would say, and don't you think that's a good question? And people say, yeah, it's a great question. But his answer was, what a stupid question. And uh, the reason why he said it was a stupid question, I mean, he didn't put it quite as politely as that, by the way, but that's the point he made, was that uh, the answer to your question is, if I thought I would get caught, I wouldn't do it, you fool. Uh, um, and therein lies the point. The, there is no magic uh, solution uh, um, from offenders generally and fraudsters specifically. And of course, fraud is a very wide type of offence. But if I could say something, if I could say something, that for me, the measures that are most likely to be effective in a preventative sense are those that make the offender think it's that he, she, they are going to get caught. If offenders believe they're going to get caught, then that is a really, really good impediment to them committing crime. But of course, the types of measures that feed into that vary so greatly with circumstance that uh, um, they don't lend themselves to a more simplistic answer. So my message would be, and here comes my point about fraud professionals needing to be good. Um, making offenders think they're going to get caught requires a lot of skill set, understanding of the organisation, understanding of the crime patterns, understanding of the type of offenders, and uh, uh, coordinating resources and opportunities um, to make that really effective. So that's my answer. Uh, uh, Janice, over to you. Okay, I think I'll just move on a little bit from, from what you said, Martin, is actually when I spoke to fraudsters in prison and I said to them, what, what would stop you doing this again? And they basically said, well, not a lot really, because I'm here now in this nice open prison. I've got other people around me. I'm getting a tax benefit. I can go to the gym. There was lots of things they could see were quite positive. But they, what, what a number of them said to me, they said, what would have stopped me though, is if I'd have been still in a closed prison and in those sort of few days or weeks when they're first convicted and they're put actually in closed prison facilities, they think a lot differently about what they've done and whether they would risk it again. When they then go to open prison um, conditions, they have a lot more time to uh, think about it, to talk to other people who've done similar things and basically to come up with their next scheme if they want to. So I think that there's a bit of a, um, a message there in terms of, are, you know, are we actually sending out a strong enough message to, to fraudsters about what will happen to them if they get caught? Mm -hmm. Yes, because, oh, sorry. sorry, sorry I was just going to say, because um, Karen made a follow-up comment that not many fraudsters actually end up going to prison um, in London from, from her experience. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it, when you think of that um, disincentive if they don't even end up in prison at all, um, I suppose. That's all I was going to say. Yes, no, well, well quite, that's quite so. Uh, um, and most forces. Are, and therein is the problem with this word fraud. I mean, uh, um, you never ever, as a, as a lecturer, uh, give a talk without fraud, without first saying this means a whole range of different things, a whole range of activities, a whole range of offences that actually don't sit very neatly under one umbrella. Um, but as you say, many, many uh, um, offenders don't end up in prison, but those that do uh, um, um, uh, have to sort of cope with the consequences. And uh, I would say this though, there's a really good book just out. It's by Chris Atkins, uh, um, who was uh, a, a documentary maker and a very good and renowned one, who uh, got himself involved in some scam and got sentenced to five years. And he's written a book, it's only recently been published. Chris Atkins, worth having a, a look at it because it tells his experience. Uh, um, of being in uh, uh, Wandsworth, I think it was, and uh, uh, how he had to adjust to the circumstances. It's in part a story about uh, prison. It's also in part a story about uh, um, a fraudster who hasn't committed any offences up to now, having to adjust to uh, that environment. One for us all to buy straight away, I think. Sounds very interesting. Um, really good. Yeah, fantastic. Um, just the, another question then um, about the data sharing um, situation and whether we, the, the research that you've done found that we wanted to expand the current NFI, the National Fraud Initiative arrangements, and increase the organisations in there or where was another approach that was suggested? Um, 
Well, data sharing cropped up a lot, and of course, as I as I hopefully said, there are a lot of issues about uh, data sharing uh, uh, that need to be tackled. It's, um, it's one of those areas, you know, that people talk about as a given. Big data, more data being available, use AI to analyze it. Uh, um, but you know, it's uh, people at the moment are struggling to cope with what they've got. Uh, um, the inaccuracy of data, the legal barriers, the difficulty of coming in different forms into different systems, uh, um, the uh, whole concern about the Data Protection Act uh, 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 and other uh, um, um, sharing arrangements. In theory, it sounds easy, but our sample said that in practice, uh, it's fraught with uh, fraught with difficulties. Janice, do you want to add any more sort of depth behind that from what we did? I think the only thing I'd just like to say on top of that really was obviously it's not just the actual sharing of it as well, it's the use of it afterwards. And what we found from a number of people was that they found that, you know, even where they were able to share data from other organisations, they then legally couldn't use that data to actually go through with prosecutions because of how that data was originally um, got got by the, the original organization so i think there's issues around that that need to be looked at as well legislative wise excellent thank you very much that's that's really useful context i mean it's a complicated landscape isn't it that's the, that's really what the key message of all of this is it sounds easy have more data share more data but actually it's not in any way as straightforward as that um just seeing if we've got any more final questions here um so we discussed quite a bit about the need to professionalize and sort of up the profile of the counter fraud profession and we were wondering whether you had any sense of whether the people you spoke to wanted their own profession in their own council or their own sector or whether they wanted a sort of nationwide approach was there anything that came up on that i'm going to say not specifically uh, um, but let's be clear, the, 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 the message out there is that uh, uh, there needs to be more recognition uh, uh, and more perhaps mutual support uh, um, for tackling an area which is um, enormous, growing, has enormous consequences and where the professionals involved can lead the, can lead the thinking and lead the, uh, um, lead the approach Packed. It needs others to meaningfully engage to make it all work. Um, so uh, um, the more general point was that this is an area that's been greatly underdeveloped and uh, needs to be a real um, key point of focus going forward, which is why of the many things we could have done, uh, we did make that one of our uh, key recommendations. Dennis, any kind of final comments from you? I think I just agree with you that I think if we look at how um, internal audit has developed possibly over the last 20 years due to the, the similar sort of push, um, we could see this also for counter fraud. Brilliant. Um, so I'm afraid we're running out of time now. Um, thank you all very much for participating, for your questions and comments that have all come through in the chat box here that we've all seen and been engaged with. Really big thank you to Martin and Janice again for the research and for such a fantastic presentation of it today. Um, I would urge you all to look on the website, go and download the full report. Also have a look at SIPFA's summary and key points on the perspectives on fraud, insights from local government. We've drawn out a few themes there that we'll be building on over the next weeks and months that follow. Um, and just a big thank you again. And if you have any more questions you want to ask, feel free to email us at SIPFA, so laura.huff at SIPFA.org if there's anything else you'd like to ask about. Brilliant. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Martin and Janice, again for your fantastic presentation.